Well, when I teach the students in, in our university, which are actually engaged in production, but I do it from reception side, I, I use this model because it's, it's easy to understand. When we, when we see a movie, we, we see and hear, and we process, this, process the, the movie with, with our visual cortex and the rest of the brain. Um, association cortex, the, and, and for me, most importantly, the, 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 the frontal cortex where we make this uh, moral ev evaluation. Sometimes we also are activated in the motor cortex, we jump or clench our fists or something. But completely, all this together creates emotion. But this is a very simplified model of, of how the vision works. But uh, this is more your field of, of how, how it, it works here in the brain, actually. Sure. So uh, at least we have a, a certain number of, uh, of, good, uh, of good modeling here. Number one, a movie, you not only uh, watch it, you hear it, uh, unless it's just, uh, you know, uh, very old movies, where it's just images. Uh, what is interesting is to notice that it's not only um, uh, step by step, it's, it's a parallel processing. That means that there are many things going on at the same time, and it's not just I see, I feel, uh, I think, uh, I move. It's all, you know, in parallel that is occurring. Um, obviously, vision is taking a third of the uh, cortex, so it's very important. Um, then you have uh, um, mentioned uh, what you call associative uh, cortex, which is some kind of a lobe which is taking care of both, you know, uh, what, I, what I feel and what I see, and again, uh, and uh, what I do. Um, the frontal lobe is more uh, for control. So you were mentioning moral uh, decision, not only it's decision. It's, process, it's, uh, it's planification, it's planning, it's uh, uh, inhibiting our um, uh, reflex, I would say. Um, and uh, it's really uh, the control uh, of, uh, of the whole brain. Um, and and the consciousness. The, Sorry? The, the, the consciousness. The, the consciousness, <laughs> there is a big debate about consciousness, which probably, you know, uh, is, on the, uh, is taking uh, place uh, on the whole brain. It's uh, when there is a certain threshold of activation that then the stimuli becomes uh, conscious um, and accessible to consciousness. Uh, so it's not just one lobe against the other. No. Something that I, I, I find interesting uh, is the number four, which is the motor cortex, premotor cortex. Um, because you just mentioned we, we clinch our fist, uh, we move and so on. Not only, there is something very interesting uh, which has been discovered uh, a, a few decades ago, which are the mirror neurons. That means that when you do something, uh, when you watch something, uh, some, someone doing something, you have the same neurons start firing as when you do the thing by yourself. So Micro you, you relieve things and it's exactly you know, the same kind of activation of the brain. So seeing people doing, you know, at the end of the day, triggers the fact that my neurons will mirror that action and that I will relieve uh, in a certain way uh, um, the, the action. And, uh, and we know now that, uh, unfortunately, for people who have been brain damaged uh, and, uh, or uh, who cannot move their limbs, you know, they can, uh, uh, just by thinking, move a cursor, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, the thinking uh, or the viewing uh, is triggering um, uh, this, uh, this activation of the movement. Um, and you have the emotions. Again, no hierarchy. Uh, emotions are not at the heart or uh, at the periphery. They are uh, an information as the other information, verbal information, visual uh, um, or uh, uh, acoustic informations. What makes that sometimes uh, I feel an emotion as a, as a viewer or I make a judgment? What, what if everything is in parallel? What, what, what decides the part of it that is conscious and the part that is not conscious? Do you see what I mean? Or? Yeah, I would say that emotions, uh, you cannot repress them. A judgment, you can rethink your judgments. But as we, uh, as we said, judgments can be very automatic sometimes. And it's good because uh, to, to make quick decisions is very important for, um, 
for, for our daily life uh, and even for our survival. Uh, so, but I would make a difference between judgment and emotions. Uh, emotions is really uh, this part of cognition uh, which is with the universal type of uh, emotion that we mentioned. Um, and judgment uh, would, you know, it's taking a decision and this is more the frontal lobe which is making a decision. Is an emotion linked to uh, cultural background, for example? You take a viewer for a certain background and another for another background and the emotion in front of the same, same film, I the think emotion is different? Uh, the, what what uh, uh, neurosciences uh, uh, teach us is that emotions are universal. Even very, uh, very young babies do have, you know, the uh, facial expressions are universal. Uh, wherever you, you are born, you, you mentioned uh, fear, disgust, uh, joy, uh, all these kind of, of, of key emotions uh, are universal and everybody um, in the world, uh, uh, everyone is feeling the same kind of emotions. Now, they are probably nuanced uh, by uh, the cultural background. Some things might, uh, might feel disgusting in some, uh, in some cultures because they are not used to it and some others uh, are, are you know, uh, basic and uh, uh, from the daily life. So there is probably some kind of uh, second level of um, emotional uh, processing which depends on the, what you have been exposed to or what is considered collectively acceptable or on the contrary uh, uh, repugnant or... Uh... Could I add to, to that? Because uh, the, the cultural context and, the, and your, your cultural background and your ideological horizon actually is a really interesting topic of, of study. Uh, there is a, a Morocco scholar, he, he wanted to check how Morocco, a young Morocco audience watched American movies, action movies. And he found that they were aroused and, and they were, uh, had these emotions of, of disgust when it was a suicide bomber uh, blowing up himself in a, in a street. And, and uh, they felt the supposed feelings of disgust and, and to just to, to they dislike this character. So that was the, the, the first level of, of emotions in their experience. Uh, then they had some kind of a meta meta perspective because they disliked the American point of view on their own culture. So, so they didn't like the, the, the Islamophobic, the, the, the anti-Muslim sentiment that the American film had put into the narrative. So it was very extreme complex emotionally reaction to the, to the film. At the same time, you at mean? At the same time. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, well, that's a question for, for you. Was it at the same time? But th when they were interviewed, they could first... After. After, mm. after. When they were interviewed, after the film, they could tell that they felt this, this suicide bomber was an awful guy, a, a really disastrous person, an antagonist. And that was the first level. Mm -hmm. And which was, which was in the script, of course. So you, you were supposed to dislike this nasty character. So uh, you can both so it's enjoy the movie uh, yeah. and despise it. Exactly. Mm. They, they enjoyed the movie and disliked it on well, the next level because well, it least, was stereotypical. At, at least the emotion was universal. Someone killing uh, blindly uh, innocent people, uh, you know, someone like that is, is, uh, is not like, it's not, is not a likable uh, character. And this is universal. Yes, I agree. Uh, I agree. Uh, so probably uh, uh, this emotion uh, would have been uh, felt by anyone watching yes, this, this yes. movie. But then on second thought, uh, people understand what the message is behind. And this kind of, uh, uh, I would say, um, this improper connection between this, uh, this uh, terrorist and the whole Islamic culture. Uh, which cannot be, uh, you know, reduced one to the other. So uh, this, these viewers had two layers of interpretation. Yes, yes, yes. The immediate exactly. interpretation, which is that they cannot repress, they find, they, they find this, this character not likable and awful. But then they understand what, uh, what the, the message could be 
of this movie yeah. and reinterpret their emotion uh, after the facts. Because, and, and that's, what, what, that's interesting because that is high cognition, in my views, when, when you are judging the situation with the help of, of your worldview and your political knowledge about what is going on. So it's very deeply contextual, mm -hmm. this next. But can you do it during the watching of, it, of the film? Or do you That's need a good the verb, verbal, you know, the time of analy analysis and... My answer would be that different viewers are actually doing it in different situations. Some people, quick, clever people, no, sorry, not clever, but they, they make this distinction immediately when they, what they think, oh, this is too stereotypical. Some people, they do it afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's a typical uh, coffee you take after the film with your friend and you discuss about yes. it. And it makes you change your mind sometimes about what you felt during the, uh, you, during the, the film watching. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Can I ask you a question about the fact that you are interviewing people and you ask them what movie they come back to? So, in fact, the question is not uh, can you do it uh, while you're watching the movie, but why are you watching this movie over and over and over? What about that experience? Well, that was the big surprise in my latest project that people were actually returning to, to movies because I, I asked, could you mention five favorite movies? And then could you mention how many times you, you guess you have watched these movies? And the big surprise was that people had watched their, their favorite movie 20, 30, 50 times, which was a complete surprise for me because I've, I've never watched a movie more than eight, nine times. So there is a new level of repet repetitive viewing going on in a younger generation. These, these people were 20 to 35. Um, and and that, that's interesting. Why the, 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 It's a research question. Why do you actually see this movie again and again and again, this repetition? And some of them who watched, for example, Amelie, he, uh, one young woman, 30 years old, involved in television industry, she had watched Amelie 50 times. By herself, mostly, just some, sometimes. Well. And, uh, well, she told me that this film is important for her, her feelings about life. So, so she returned to this film one, once in a while and, and every time to, to regain her deeper feeling of, of joy and, and uh, feeling of how the world could be if we were more creative and, and the, the, the colorful world. So it was a dreaming place. She called the film her own haven, her own hide, hiding place. So she went back to that film. So that was her answer, getting back to, to the film. And in other examples, people were getting back because of other reasons, but that, that, that was one of the reasons. The, the feel, the, she wanted to feel this euphoric um, vision that Amelie contains. So it's a way to restore a state uh, you want to live in. Exactly. So you're That's like a good way to put it. To, it's like to recharge you. Exactly. Recharge is a very good expression. Could we say that there is a link between this and a kind of addiction or being addicted to something wanting to feel the same kind of feeling that you, you had first, or is it the same kind of... Is Amelie a drug? Is film matching? <laughs> yes, and in a way. If it were a drug, the effect would be going down. Mm. Because when you're exposed to, you know, repeatedly to the same thing, uh, the brain hates what is repetitive. That means uh, that uh, it, uh, the brain needs novelty. Uh, this is from, from birth. Um, so the fact is that uh, uh, you have to, to get new things uh, to get interested. And probably so the, the, the role of this movie is not uh, like uh, getting a, a, sh a renewed shot, otherwise she would need more and more and more. Uh, maybe it's, it's, um, it compensates some, a lack of, of something. It works like a, a drug which is compensating for something which is not there. But it works every time. It works every time. So it, nice pushes, it pushes the right buttons. 
Is it what you're saying? The fact that the brain uh, needs newness, mm -hmm. is it linked to... Uh, uh, it, it, w w w why that? Is it, is it a, a need to uh, complete a wider life experience? Is it uh, just uh, this is the search for, for, for new parameters? It's, it's, a, uh, it's a basic property of, of the brain. Uh, and obviously, it has, it has a use in terms of, uh, of survival. Uh, because if you are, everything which you know already is of little interest, because this you control already. Whereas uh, what is novel, you know, might bring you additional information and would complete your understanding of the world. So, and this is true from very, very young age. So when we do research uh, with babies, we work on this novelty uh, uh, property. Uh, so we show a certain number of uh, stimuli and we know that the kid, if the kid sees something new, it will pay more attention to this new thing. So uh, there is some, uh, because a baby would not answer, would not give you uh, some verbal answer, but with just the eyesight and how long you know the baby is staring at something uh, shows you know, the interest, so the novelty. Of, uh, uh, of the thing. Even your eyes, for instance, uh, when you look, you feel that your eyes are fixed, all right, uh, almost fixed. But if, you, if it were the case, the image would just vanish because your brain, you know, would consider it something already processed. So constantly you put, you, you do small saccades, very, very uh, yeah, uh, small yeah. saccades to, to, to move the image on the ret retina in order to create novelty for your brains. So would you say that surprise is a way stimulating in a way for the brain, the feeling of surprise? Like? That's absolutely right. And we were sp speaking about engagement or immersion. So, uh, and, uh, so we understand that immersion is a deep state of engagement, but engagement is more probably a category. And I would say that uh, engagement is triggered by probably at least two things, which is attention and motivation. So there are two, uh, two brain networks in charge of, uh, uh, of attention and uh, motivation. Probably they overlap, and, but they are distinct. And we can see that, for instance, in education. How do you motivate your students? That means how do you engage them? And, uh, and that means that you have to attract their attention, but they have, you know, at least to have their motivation network uh, uh, activated in order for them to, 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 to be there and to be involved in, 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 the, in the learning process. So probably this is the same for uh, a movie. Uh, a screenwriter has you know, to attract attention and to keep motivation there in order to go until the end of the movie. Because now you know, there are so many sources of uh, distraction or, or distractor. If, if you are not appealed, then you move on. And you At the same time, uh, what about the experience of this girl who watches Amélie Poulain 20 times? She's not looking for new things. She's not looking for novelty. She's but looking I think for... she lacks something. So there is something <laughs> that she's missing and which pushes and triggers the proper, uh, the proper uh, uh, process uh, that, that, that brings her pleasure. And uh, if it were already there, she would not need it anymore. She would not need, you know, to, to get this stimulation. Yeah, yeah, I think there is something behind it. And uh, maybe you can put your finger on it. Um, Aristotle talks about the pleasure of recognition. Um, uh, this is a basic pleasure of the viewer, which is supposed to, to keep him comfortable enough to provide him uh, later with novelty. So first you have to reassure him and then you can yes. feed him novelty. And uh, I heard something, I don't know what, if you heard about it, uh, you know the, the show, uh, the American show Sesame Street, Henri Sesame in, in France, uh, which it was a long no, time ago. It started a long time ago, but it's still working well in the US. And they, they made um, studies on the kids watching and they found that for the very young ones, um, if you fed them with novelty, uh, they were losing attention and they wanted to find again and again the same 
uh, story or the same character or the same song. For example, my, my newborn baby, he recognizes the song. Obviously, it's not just the, the, the voice, it's also the song and the song makes him peaceful. So how do you find the balance between uh, novelty and uh, uh, the same again and again? Yes. That's, that's the, the big question for, for scriptwriters and creative persons. How do you create familiar recognition that you tap into people's cognitive maps, what is actually familiar to them, and to make it a novelty as well, to balance this? Because if it's 100% familiar, then it's dull. It's not interesting. If it's too, uh, the, the novelty is too much, then you, you, you don't know how to deal with this because it's not relevant, you don't recognize it. And you can also see this in, in failure, failure with films or, or things, that it's too open in, in imagery, it's too vague, so people are just disengaged because it doesn't, it's not familiar enough. You, you, they don't recognize what is going on. And that's an interesting challenge actually. Balance. Yeah. But I find, uh, so this is something that uh, probably we should uh, touch base on, which is uh, patterns. That means you don't make sense of things if you don't have an, uh, a script that you can recognize. And exactly. in, every culture, uh, in every culture, you have scripts for storytelling. And uh, if, uh, if uh, and we all know in our culture, for instance, if we start um, hearing once upon a time, we know that this will be a tale, a fairy tale or magic tale, and that we, there will be a certain number of ingredients. So we have the pattern and we have the basic script of what uh, a fairy tale is. And, uh, but then you, let, you have to fill it with a certain number of, of characters, uh, um, actions and so on, and some novelty, so that at the end of the day, it's not the endless repetition of the, of the, same, uh, of the same story. But now, uh, once we said that, there is probably for young children some kind of a balance. That means that uh, he or she needs to recognize uh, what is going on, otherwise it doesn't make any sense because you don't have this block of knowledge about how the story works. Um, number, number one. Number two, kids love reliving some emotions, like, you know, uh, I don't know, something odd or something uh, scary happens to one of the characters, and reliving, you know, this emotion is, is some kind of uh, uh, motivating. Uh, but obviously, at some point, you know, uh, kids are like everyone else. They stop paying attention if it's uh, uh, always the same, uh, the same thing. Do we know at what age we make a difference between reality and fiction? And do little kids make the difference when we tell them a story, for example? Do they make the difference? That's a very good question, and I don't have the proper answer. I can look into the literature, but I think it's, it's pretty late. It's pretty late, and some kids are really uh, 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 they can be very worried because they are some kind of swallowed by what is going on on, on the screen and they get very scared. Because I know some parents, for example, who stopped telling stories because they saw that the child didn't make any difference and it started to make to have consequences sure. on him. Yeah. So it's, it's a learning process to make the difference between reality and fiction. You're saying, in a way, it's not like something that is already there at the beginning. No, I, I think it's, uh, we build upon that. And uh, at some point, uh, it's difficult uh, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to make a difference between what is real and, uh, and what is fiction for, for young kids. And it can be, become a, a very, um, it can trigger anxiety. Mm -hmm. But is it, did, did this character, did, re, did he really kill the other one? Or did this happen really? And so on. And the kids keep on asking because they're not sure. It's, interest, it's interesting for script writers because we have the, um, the strict equivalent of patterns and it's called genres. Uh, according yes. to the genre that you are choosing, you give uh, your viewer um, something that he can recognize. Okay, it's going to be a thriller or 
detective story or maybe we can combine a romantic uh, comedy with uh, a detective story to, to make a new genre. So you expect some beats uh, to be respected and then you can play with the beats to make something new. So you, you find a balance, you give a genre or a mix of genres and you have to make it in a new way. Would you, I have a question for, uh, would you say that the more you want to surprise or you want to play with new association of genres, for example, the more you want to surprise, the more you have to establish the pattern. Would you say that or is there, is there a link between the amount of surprise you can, you can put on the table and the amount of pattern or the, the level of recognition that you need? You know, people are clever. So if you hybrid, if you put an hybrid between two recognized patterns, they would very easily make the connection. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that you have to hold the viewer's hand uh, whenever you are using a pattern uh, which is recognizable and that uh, that you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, connect. Because we were talking about explanations. And actually, you're saying in a way that we don't need explanation to put the pattern in the head or in the mind of the viewer. We can do it in another more, you know. But remember visual. about the, uh, because it's the same as in education. We all, always think about uh, the, the brain of the student. Uh, uh, and, uh, but we should think also about the, the brain of the teacher. And this is the same as for, for, for the script writer. The script writer has a brain, and the brain uh, has a structure, and he or she has some patterns. And it's very difficult uh, to uh, just forego some of, uh, of your um, uh, automatic processing. And this is the, 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 the part of the brain, which is the frontal lobe of the brain, which helps us, you know, just uh, um, uh, not do something. Otherwise, we would be very repetitive. We do constantly the same thing, and we give the same answer to, to, to different questions. So we need, you know, at some point, you know, to, to stop, you know, some automatic processing in order to have the slow processing of rebuilding things. And probably a screenwriter should sometime, you know, to try to avoid being, you know, uh, uh, using uh, the same pattern, but consciously, and seeing that he or she is just uh, uh, stuck in a very normative type of attitude or, or, or writing habits. Mm -hmm. Or maybe at least recognize his own patterns, the pattern that he's using or she's using all right, the definitely. time. Yeah. But, but I've learned that research on, on genres are, are, I mean, we are extremely sensitive. Aha, uh -huh, this is this kind of film. So immediately we understand what kind of genre it is. And also research on that, that the, the combination and the new combination of, of different genres are actually the films that take the film history further on, that there is a new drastic combination of genres that, that creates these huge innovation films that that actually affects many people because it's joyful, it's something new, and, and relies on, on rec recognized patterns that we are familiar with. And, and, uh, and recognizing pattern is key because again, it's, it's, it's fast. And if it's not fast, it becomes complex. And if it's complex, you have to think. And if you have to think, you have to disengage and you lose track. So you need at least some, uh, uh, some familiarity uh, with things. And probably when you see new um, or very, uh, very innovative filmmakers, uh, I think about Jean-Luc Godard, for instance, uh, he, he is just uh, uh, destroying the pattern of the storytelling. And at some point, you know, you said, but what's going on? What is he trying to tell me? And what should I, f what sh sh should I understand? Uh, in, uh, in, um, in his movie. Depletion is doing that also. At some point, you know, doing very, very long, long, long movies with many, many characters, and you don't understand what is the connection between these people and so on. And at some point, you disengage because your brain has, you know, to take over the situation in order to try to make sense of what's going on. But his last movie is a detective story. Oh, well, it's a police story and a genre. So he's coming back to genre. Yeah, and, and it helps us a lot. 
So about fiction, about fiction learning and the difference between reality and fiction, how can we explain that when, we're, when we are children, we don't, sometimes we don't make differences, then we learn to make a difference, then we use fiction as adult in a certain way to learn, if I understand you well, to learn some possibilities or to learn to be confronted to some possibilities of life that we don't live. Mm -hmm. And how can we be so attracted to this world? How can we stay in our, in our seats doing two hours and not moving so much and being emerged, as we say, or engaged so much in, in an unreal world like that? Is there a, an explanation to this? Just what we, what we could mention is that we are not passive viewers. Probably we mentioned, you know, the uh, uh, mirror neurons, you know, the number four of your model, that means on the premotor cortex that uh, is fires when you, when you, you watch something, uh, even if you don't do it. So that means that uh, you build the situation as you see it, and it's an active process. You are not purely, you know, and maybe this is uh, something we should say about uh, talking about the viewer, because the viewer is supposed to be just, you know, looking and, and, and being passively fed with a, a flow of, of information. But I guess that uh, uh, an engaged viewer is an active viewer who uh, is uh, building or rebuilding the story for his own, sa own sake. This has to be checked. Because, but this is what we know about uh, memories, for instance. Memories, we don't get back the memories as such. We rebuild memories every time we recall them. It's not just taking something which is there and that we would just take out of, the, of a library of, uh, of memories, but it's constantly you know, rebuilt. This is why every time you recall a memory, you change the memory because you rebuild it and you rebuild it slightly differently. So to keep a memory pure, you should try never to recall it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good quotation of, of David Bordwell, this uh, groundbreaking uh, film scholar. He, he says, he has a quote, uh, what a hammer uh, is for the hand, a tool. Movies is a tool for the mind to think about life. So the movies is actually a perfect tool for the mind to, to reflect and ponder of, about uh, what life is about. And I think that is a good question. I mean, we, we, we spend a lot of time watching movies, sitting two hours. Uh, so it, and, and we are meaning-making animals. That's, that's my understanding of, of, of the man and uh, human beings, that we are meaning-making creatures. And for some reason, movies is perfect for engagement in, in dealing with meaning. A cop uh, told me that when he's uh, following someone, at some point he's, he's forgetting about everything else. And this is the moment when it's dangerous because uh, somebody can see him following the person and it's called a tunnel effect. So maybe there's some connection between what we are trying to provide on the screen, like this tunnel effect. Uh, it's not immersion as if you lose control about everything. It's just that you are very engaged and active following one target and then you forget about the rest. It's a certain, would you say that it's a, it's a certain kind of focus in a way or attention and we have to be motivated to, but not consciously motivated or, or the film brings us motivation to be engaged like in this state of attention, which is, is it natural in a way? Is it something, this kind of attention that we have in front of movies, is it something that we can have in life? And is it the same in life and in movies, this kind of being uh, focused like this? Yeah, I think this is, uh, this is universal. That means that uh, there are th some things that we are uh, attracted to and b f to which we, we would we dedicate lots of attentional resources and some others which are considered to be uh, uh, not useful or interesting and that, uh, that we will not uh, attend to. Now, we all know in uh, um, video games, for instance, action video games, is that attention is, f is attracted by the action. 
That means that the viewer or the player doesn't have to be actively uh, 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 seeking inner attentional uh, uh, reserves, but uh, is attracted, is glued or, uh, uh, to, to, to what's going on in the screen. This is, uh, uh, as we mentioned, the difference between uh, inner uh, attention, the one uh, that uh, we are able to dedicate uh, willingly uh, to something, uh, and outer attention. That means that uh, uh, what the world uh, is doing is attracting your, your attention. And probably there is a, probably a mixture between the two. That means in an action movie, you are constantly, uh, uh, um, I would say, attracted, or at least uh, the, the, the screenwriter tries to constantly motivate you to follow what's going on the, on the screen. On some other films, you have to, to go deep and find your own resources to pay attention to what's going on. But that's interesting because uh, sometimes uh, in, in my uh, research I've seen that, that people are using the, the films that are on the commercial cinemas, action films and adventure films and comedies. Uh, and when these action films also uh, has parts which are slower that gets you to think and, and feel, when, when, when an, a good action movie has, has these passages when, it, when the tempo is going down, and you can actually engage, because just tempo doesn't engage you very much. So you have to have these moments of, of contemplation. And people actually are using the, the films that are there at the commercial film uh, cinemas to, to reflect about their own life. But the, the films has to, to have some qualities also to, to, to invite for that. Uh, and it's, it, it is an interesting difference between uh, research on, on computer games, uh, when you actually are doing things a lot. And you can compare when a, a, a famous film series has become a computer game, they have to change some ingredients from the, the movie. For example, the uh, one scene in the Harry Potter movie is when he's standing in front of the mirror and reflecting about himself and his relations to his dead parents. In the book and in the film, it is there and, and you can give space for that. The, the character is actually thinking about things. But when that creates into a game, a computer game, you have to get rid of that moment when he's just standing there. And, and then instead he's running around in the library. So, so the, game, the games follows another, another uh, logic of, of doing things instead of reflecting things. And, and th that has a deep and uh, th that has a deep consequence for, for what, what storytelling is and what a game is. Of course, games have, have, have uh, stories as well. But we, we need this because I think that it's, it's valid also to talk about that we, we are meaning-making animals, we create symbols, and we have this transitional space between our deep inner reality and our real concrete reality. And it's, it is the symbolic realm where we have the symbols, where religion were created years back and centuries, and now we have the culture sector, the, the films, the theater and everything, and that we can move into this transitional space and, and play with our inner reality related to the outer reality through this in-between, where, where the films actually are taking place for us. And that's why we can sit for two hours and, and we, we move into that, it's, it's a threshold. We, we move into it and then we go back. I think Thomas has an example with uh, Pulp Fiction. Exactly. Uh, with a viewer. That's very fascinating. Uh, one, the, the woman I, I interviewed about her favorite movie was Pulp Fiction. And this key scene that she picked was a, a focus on, on the main character, Bruce Willis, when he's st standing on the doorsteps uh, and he is hesitating because he can take a step out to his own freedom in the shop. It's a scene where, where he and the Marcellus Wallace, the, 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 the mafia guy, is beating, beaten up in the cellar and he's tortured by, by two white police, his, his enemy actually. So he's standing there wanting to leave, but then he hears the screams of, of, of the Marcellus Wallace and instead of climbing out 
in freedom, he goes back and saves his enemy. And he kills these police. And when the camera is actually focusing on his face, my interviewee, she, she tells me, now you can see how he thinks. It's, he, it's his consciousness that thinks. And then she, she describes what Bruce Willis' character thinks. But it's just a silent, no, it's not a silent clip, but it's uh, his face and some music. And he, she project on the screen what he thinks. And he actually states it. He thinks that, no, what should I do? Should I get out? No, hell not. I will get down and give them bastards. Now I will show them hell. So she articulates in her view when she's sitting watching the film exactly what Bruce Willis is thinking. And it's also an interesting misperception because she believes that the camera is zooming in on his face. But it's actually not a zoom. As if you could, you could watch what is happening within the brain. Uh, no, not really that, but, but she perceives that you can see how the camera zooms. I mean, she, she, she's so engaged in this moment. She's zooming in. She's, zooming, she's the one zooming But in. the camera is not zooming because I was going back to the scene. No, the camera is, is on the same uh, distance all the time. It's very interesting for directors because what you say is that if somebody is very engaged in the moral um, dilemma or question of the character, you don't need to zoom in. Exactly. The viewer is already doing it. The viewers, so exactly. You shouldn't uh, push it too much. Yeah. Sometimes it's you just need to leave itself. space for the viewer to make the, the work. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because when he, she really loves that character, talking about empathy. He's a, he has killed people before, but now he shows that he has a moral sentiment, that he cannot leave uh, the, the tortured guy in the, the basement. He must go back because he has a moral code. Code. Yeah. And she talks about that moral mm. code. And when he, when she realizes that Bruce Willis' character has this moral code, she really loves him, and it enhances her engagement in, in the character that he actually go back and, and help this guy instead of taking the the uh, egoistic way out to freedom. She's doing the projection. The, it, it's an interesting way when, when, you're, when someone is projecting the, the, the film, but the viewer is, is also engaged in the projection of, of thoughts into the film. So it's a double projection going on from the, from the camera, projector, and from the viewer to the same screen. It's Would you say that it's a kind of moral recognition that she went through? Absolutely. So. Moral recognition mm -hmm. and love. Since he had this moral code, she loves him more. So mm -hmm. there is a theoretical interest in that, that when you evaluate the character and you recognize that, oh, this is a moral person, then you, your, your engagement is, is enhanced and, and focused. I think that's very important because screenwriters are always told uh, do we have enough empathy for this character? Do we not love him or at least understand him enough, understand his inner battle, his inner emotions, and so on? And it seems that you're saying that morality or the, the capacity of make moral choices is key in that empathy uh, process. For her, yes. For her. Oh, is it possible to generalize this or not? Do you have any? For many, I would say, for many. But not for all, but I, I would say for many. If you're interested in, in the mainstream audience, I should say that this is a, re a required recipe, that you have to have a, an engagement which taps into a moral recognition by the many. Yeah, okay. could we add something? Because it's not, I, I think it's not about just a moral code, it's a moral conflict. We, uh, this is a conflicted character she's uh, talking about. The guy has a conflict. He's, he has to survive, he's got to go away, but there's something, there's an hesitation, and then there's a moment of thought, and then there's decision making. But if you don't have this uh, moral conflict, you've got nothing to watch. 
You got that's true. You got that's nothing true. to follow. You got nothing to engage with. So I think it's more about moral conflict, and this is why uh, often uh, people from the well TV producers they say to the screenwriters, "Well, you your character is not likable." You know, so people are not going to feel any empathy for it. But the example you just took is amazing because you have a nurse and I think she's the target of uh, the TV people and she's enjoying the moral conflict, not just the resolution, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think this is a way to show maybe that empathy is not just about the choice, but about the conflict itself. If you look at the Godfather, the guy is nice at the beginning and he becomes worse and worse and you like it even more at the end, you know? At the end he's become a good father and he's made only bad moral choices, self-destructive, destructive for his family and you like him all the most because he's an example of failure that you can connect with because uh, uh, most of us, we just make bad decisions. <laughs> hmm. What, what uh, neuroscience is today can say about empathy or this thing that we have, the, the capacity of understanding each other and projecting ideas and feelings in someone else. How can we... So this is a very basic human uh, capacity. That means uh, uh, we are uh, social, uh, social players. That means that we cannot exist without our other human beings. So we, we are born with a very strong sense of empathy um, and being able to understand what's going on in the mind of the others, what we call theory of mind. <clears throat> because we don't have any direct connection. I don't have any direct connection with your thought process, what is in your mind and so on. I can even think yeah, that you have false beliefs. That means you believe as true things that I know are not true. Um, so there is, a, I know that I know that you know, and so on, so and so forth. So the fact is that empathy um, is is really our basic tool for survival because we need to attract cooperation by our other, uh, the other human beings around us, and um, so so this uh, this uh, you know chemistry between uh, people is fundamental. So and, to, it seems that that's a key innate. point. Yeah. That's a key point because it seems that in our field, screenwriting and, and storytelling, uh, it seems that we are said that empathy has to be built all the time. But you're saying that empathy is already there. And if we don't have empathy, is that it's because probably the, the 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 character is fake. That means that we recognize mm -hmm. uh, uh, very automatically that this is uh, it has been built up. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, it is not, he or she is not uh, uh, having, you know, the characteristic of, of a human being that uh, I can relate to. So, uh, so, so, so uh, as you said, probably that's very true. We don't have to build empathy either. We have to not lose it. We acknowledge, in a way. We acknowledge um. empathy, uh, mm. but we cannot uh, uh, really... Um, it's not necessary uh, to, 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 or at least it has been to be built in a way because uh, a movie is, is made. So uh, obviously you have to, to create it, but um, it, it emerges or, or it doesn't uh, if the character is true. But would you say that, for example, a viewer at the very beginning of a film is ready to have empathy? He's ready, he has his capacity, and, but sometimes, if, if I follow you right, empathy doesn't work or is lost because of the fakery or the yeah. character. Or this, but at the beginning, it is there. There is this possibility. Absolutely. And uh, we feel for others. We feel uh, that means that uh, we, we, we step into the shoes of the others because we need to know what is going on in other people's mind in order to react appropriate, uh, in the appropriate way. So, so, so this, is, uh, uh, this is a key condition for um, uh, social uh, survival. Does it also mean that uh, humans being craving for empathy, you know, I mean, they are looking for signs of empathy uh, around them. If the filmmaker or the screenwriter don't pr 
provide a possible access to these humans that are uh, embodied in the film, uh, it frustrates the viewer. The fact that you are denied, denied as a, if you're denied as a viewer, the possibility to empathize or to find an access to the other, you're frustrated. Yeah, but frustration can be an engine for, for uh, motivation and engagement because probably what we, we mentioned many times are the basic rules of the human brain and mind, uh, the patterns that we need, uh, uh, recognition that we uh, crave for and so on, and that we need for, to create meaning. Uh, but probably violating the rules is probably a key ingredient in any interesting story. That means that you need to, for example, comedy, uh, uh, a joke, a joke is always a violation of the rules of language. Uh, and the statement is always a violation of, uh, of the rules, uh, uh, the basic rules of, of language. So probably a screenwriter has a very difficult job because he has, on the one hand, you know, to use um, the key elements of storytelling so that it's, uh, the viewer can follow, but he has to, uh, to, to just uh, create some kind of, um, to break from the rules at some point to, uh, to, to create interest uh, and, uh, and um, an engagement. Then engagement, we know that for teaching. Uh, if it's too easy, if it's too transparent, if things are obvious, uh, the learner will lose track and will lose interest. So you have to, to strike the proper balance between, uh, on the one hand, uh, access, so that uh, you know, the, the jump is not too, too high, uh, otherwise you say, there is no way I can understand or, or, I, can, uh, or I can really have a good command of what is going on. Uh, uh, so it needs to be at the proper, or, but if it's too simple or too obvious or uh, repetitive, people Yes, I agree. But I have a, qu a counter question to you guys who are actually into the script writing uh, doctors. Because the old truth would be that empathy is, is necessary to, to build an empathy to the, to, to the protagonist. Otherwise, the, the film will... Lose. Or repulsion. Or repulsion. Works also. Uh, yes. But maybe you know something now that today we have moved on so you can also create anti-heroes and, and antagonists that are equally engaging for the, the, the audience. Because the old truth may be not be, be the, tu the truth today. Because I, I've been recently watched the, the, the American TV series Succession, um, which is a bunch of super rich, super uh, narcissistic uh, assholes. Everyone. So it was a frustration for me to watch because I, I was, uh, jumping from one character to the other to, to, to cling on to someone decent. But it was, nobody was decent. Everyone was corrupt. Uh, so it was very interesting to, to watch this. Uh, and finally, I found myself watching with curious distance on, on these strange characters. But still interest. Still interest. But it was a new, and, and of course there are many series and, and movies that, that are actually putting up a, a, a non-sympathetic character at the center, as you mentioned before, the, the wire and things like that. A connection is, uh, I think, the important word. I would make a distinction between empathy and sympathy. Sure. Um, and um, I read something in Spinoza a long time ago, and uh, it gives a very simple definition of empathy. He says, uh, you just need to imagine that something, he doesn't say human being, but something is feeling something to feel exactly the same thing. Which means that if you watch a robot um, feeling something, you can feel the same thing as the robot because you are so social, yeah. Yeah. you can build a social link with a fiction character. Uh, when, this is what happens when we watch uh, like Nemo, like you know, animated Wally. movie, yeah. Wally, you make a connection very strong. There's not a word for 30 minutes and you build a connection with a garbage robot. Um, and uh, so empathy 
we are so social. I think this is very important to say to screenwriters. You don't need to have a human being on screen to build empathy. And empathy is not connected with sympathy. You don't need to see someone who's nice. You just need to see something that you can imagine, feel something, to feel the same thing. This is you doing the work, you're doing the heavy lifting. If you look at E.T., this is fascinating, E.T., this is the movie that moves everybody in the world, everybody's crying at the end. And it's just a robot that looks like a frog with two big eyes that look like a cat's eye. Uh, cat's eyes and it's just well it's something with eyes and the mouth and it's got to learn the language it looks like a disgusting frog you know and you build empathy with it and the sequel of E.T. which is the series Stranger Things uh, they build um, uh, empathy with the worm like a like a creature that is very dangerous but if you if you tell it the right way, you can build empathy with just anything. Maybe with a rock, with a computer, with a... Uh, you were talking about Jean-Luc Godard. Jean-Luc Godard says you have to be nice with machines because they can't defend themselves. So this is an idea. If you think that a machine is unable to um, resist uh, if you want to break it, then suddenly you can build empathy with your computer, you know, if you're Jean-Luc Godard, I guess. But uh, uh, for the common viewer, uh, Immediately, if something is on screen and it's like moving, maybe you can imagine it's feeling something and uh, you can feel empathy. So that opens a lot of perspectives for screenwriting, I think. And what you say is very true. That means some experiments have been made with very young uh, children uh, and it's just with shapes, you know, uh, yeah. a square pushing yes. around and or uh, a square uh, trying to, um, to um, I would say, uh, not give access to another geometric uh, um, uh, shape to some places and so on and so forth. And immediately the, the child is projecting uh, uh, feelings and uh, attitudes um, to this uh, uh, material uh, type of, uh, of things. So there is uh, something very much ingrained uh, yes. in the human being. Uh, to, to As soon as we consider, so it's not that easy with computers or things, um, but as soon as we think that the shape or the thing has some kind of uh, um, willpower, that means decide to, to do something by itself, we recognize it by something as a living thing, and then we project uh, feelings and sentiments. Mm -hmm.